In this video, I talk with Kiyosaku John Mitchell, or John, who I met on Twitter. Uh, John talks a lot about Zen and Buddhism and Buddhist practice in contemporary America as a householder and a dad. And I've really enjoyed his tweets and talking with him a little bit here and there. So wanted to dive in deeper to hearing about his life and his practice and you know how he got to doing Zen practice as a dad in suburban America and really, really enjoyed this conversation so much and learned a tremendous amount. And I hope that you'll enjoy listening to it. Thanks for joining me today, John. I'm happy to be here, Tashin. Uh, so just to maybe surface a little bit about why I wanted to talk to you, like I've been following you on Twitter for, I don't know, maybe, I don't know exactly how long, but like five or six months or something like that, and feel a real kinship to the way that you're showing up there and like sort of, um, like we're coming from different backgrounds, but there's a similar flavor of like playfulness and authenticity and uh, excitement and expressivity that I resonate with. And I am I'm sort of like, I've enjoyed like vibing with you on Twitter and really mm -hmm. wanted to have a conversation just to hear more about your background and where you're coming from. Um, so yeah, so yeah, I think that'd be a good place to start is just hearing from you about like where this whole journey started from you, for you and uh, in whatever way you want to take that. Yeah, the whole journey would have to be defined a little bit, I suppose. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I've been off the inter. I had been off the public internet completely, except for on my own website. Just sort of like I'm putting me over here, and you could come over here if you want to find me, but I'm not going anywhere else uh, for a few years uh, before I popped in on Twitter in the midst of a. Uh, pandemic of the isolation of the pandemic to try and find some community uh and when i went offline i was sort of severing a chapter of my life that was entirely consumed by being online as a uh as a virtue as a as a as the way things work uh and as uh, a source of livelihood for me uh, that I had become sick of. Uh, so I took a couple of years to reboot. And part of that reboot involved uh, rediscovery of my Zen practice as sort of a central component of my life. Uh, but that's a process that goes way back. And I, and I, will, I will get into the sort of roots of that journey uh, eventually, I'm sure. But the the decision to come back online during the pandemic was intentional about sharing that aspect of my life and looking for community there. And it was actually even kind of a uh, service oriented choice. It wasn't really that I was specifically looking to be uh, out there as myself. It was that I had joined the Sangha and found a way to contribute to the activity of the Sangha and to, and to propagating the teachings of the Sangha, um, which was doing basically the kind of stuff that I did professionally uh, as on a volunteer basis, making podcasts and uh, doing sort of website stuff for the Sangha. And I wanted to find the people that I hoped were out there who would be interested in the kind of Zen that I was looking for and found in the Sangha, which was not, uh, not, not a, well, I don't want to, I don't want to contrast it negatively to anything. It, it's very creative and, per, and, and, and uh, idiosyncratic from person to person, very American, uh, but, but also very rooted in tradition. And, the I just sort of it sort of to me it felt like it was exactly the right people and exactly the right practice and exactly the right time, and it helped me so much. Kind of pull myself together after the initial body blow of lockdown started, that I sort of suspected or hoped, or both, that there were other people out there feeling the same way. So I decided to go back on Twitter because it was something I knew how to do, uh, to share these shows we were making. And what I found was an absolutely breathtaking 
diverse community of people at all different kinds of points along various paths, many, almost as many paths as there are people probably, uh, a lot of whom had a Zen background, a lot of whom had other Buddhist backgrounds, a lot of whom had explicitly non-Buddhist backgrounds, a lot of whom had uh, Jewish or Christian backgrounds like I do, a lot of whom had no religious backgrounds whatsoever, and increasingly, a lot of whom are international, a lot of, a lot of people, Muslim people in Muslim countries who are speaking English and hanging out with people with like Americans with no religious background talking about philosophy or, or just crap, you know, whatever people want to talk about. Like the, the, the kind of diversity that I'm, that I found out there was like nothing I'd ever found anywhere in my life. And it made me much more personally invested in what was happening and made me want to show up more personally as myself. So I did continue talking about the Sangha. I did continue sharing these podcasts and talking about Zen in a very intentional uh, sort of representative way. But I started talking about everything else too, because, you know, Zen is, Zen is everything else. So I began to share myself and find people and make friends like you. And a lot of us have as a sort of first basis for talking to each other, similar backgrounds in terms of practice or uh, or disciplines, or reading the same books, or whatever it might be. Uh, but as we just found enough people with enough breadth and depth, that some something something more organic than that started to happen. It isn't just a bunch of like Buddhists hanging out with each other, or ex Buddhists, or whatever. You know, like it 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 isn't it isn't any particular thing at all. It's its own entity, and I and I'm really really thrilled to be part of it. But that said, I am coming from maybe an end of the spectrum in terms of traditional modes and religious background. Uh, I, I'm also Jewish. I'm originally Jewish. I am Jewish. I don't really relate to Zen as being an am thing. I really relate to it as more of a doing. Uh, and that is what makes these two modes complementary to me and not sort of parallel or in conflict in some way. Uh, I'm a Jewish person who does Zen practice. Mm. And the Jewish background, while very complicated and full of twists and turns, is something that I've made peace with a while ago. So I'm perfectly happy and comfortable having conversations about God and religion uh, and end up in those kinds of conversations at least as often as I am in conversations about Buddhism or meditation. And the, and I'll often find myself sort of providing helpful, sometimes much needed Jewish background in conversations about the Bible or, you know, what have you, Hebrew uh, words. We love to do etymology in this sort of sector of the universe because we all come from such different places and have such different backgrounds and are also in general so well read that people are just connecting words to each other all the time and we love to go down those rabbit holes. So I sort of bring the Hebrew a lot of the time. <laughs> uh, and, and some people have a little bit of confusion about this sometimes, like how, how could I be such a committed Zen practitioner and also have like a full fledged Jewish life. I mean, I should say outright, like my wife is a rabbi. Like it's not, it's not, I'm not just like someone who happens to be Jewish. Like I, I, I'm, I'm married to a rabbi. So there's, there's some pretty heavy Judaism going on uh, a lot of the time. Uh, and, and so as you can imagine, this path has been pretty complicated. The Zen part goes pretty far back and uh, there have been some intervening chapters between Zen periods and now also. Um, but the but it's all been one pursuit, one path, one pursuit of something that I've known was, well, there's a feeling that I have that I've had for my whole life, as long as I can remember, that I'm seeking, and things that feel in conflict with that feeling that I'm trying to either resolve or, you know, keep away. Like not just I know that I know that there are certain paths that are not the right path, and I know that there are certain paths that are, and it's because I've been on it since far long before I had words to express what it was, let alone people to, people to practice it with. So, uh, you know, 
it's hard to know where to begin, but that seems like a pretty good lay of the land. Yeah, yeah, there's so much there. And I love um, how you encapsulate that of like, I am a Jewish person that does Zen practice. And I imagine that's been just such a journey to find that like concision and being able to put it that way. And mm -hmm. I think it brings up for me that a lot of my curiosity around having this conversation is because, um, yeah, I mean, your description of like Dharma or Sangha Twitter or like whatever the weird corner of Twitter is mm -hmm. uh, really resonates. And in a similar way, just interpersonally with you and interacting with your tweets, there's like um, a kinship of um, interest in, you know, meditation practice and Buddhism. And yet also like, I'm, I'm very fascinated by the differences of like, my own exposure to Zen is sort of secondhand and it was more like Rinzai than Soto. Mm -hmm. And also, um, yeah, I'm not culturally or ethnically Jewish. So, you know, I've studied some Jewish texts here and there, but know very little about it uh, in the scheme of things. So I'm, I'm, I think I want to sort of dive into that and hear more about um, those two threads and how those happen sort of like autobiographically for you and um, how they came together to that point where you can say with such like firmness, yeah, I'm a Jewish person who does Zen practice. Mm. You're quite right that it's taken me a while to get that to that point. And, and, and I've tried several different formulations of it that, that either immediately the second they came out of my mouth for the first time didn't work or eventually sort of settled in as not quite right. And this, this has been a long time coming. It, it, it really actually, I mean, I've only been a part of a Zen Sangha in a formal way for a year, a little mm -hmm. over a year. Mm -hmm. And the, it wasn't a new practice to me. So I was able to sort of find a home immediately and know it was the right place and the it was the right teacher and we were going to do the right practice. And so I took Jukai pretty early on uh, in my time there. And so, but it hasn't really been fully integrated, the, this sort of Jewish identity and this Zen practice, uh, like, it hadn't, it hadn't been, it hadn't clicked until then, until, until I took the precepts and received a Dharma name and was, you know, okay, I'm a Buddhist now. Like there's no, there's no, like there's a piece of paper that says so. Uh, and, you know, of course in Zen, we take such things very lightly and don't really, uh, you know, internalize them in such a clear way in the sort of way that people might be used to thinking about identity in this world that we live in. But what actually happened was kind of the opposite of that. I sort of outsourced the question of whether or not Zen is something that's part of my life into these forms that I uh, that were external. You know, they were things that I got up and did every morning, and they were things that I that I you know did with my teacher and with my fellow members of my sangha. And so there was no question anymore for me. They were just thing. There was it was out there. So you know, I didn't have to be it inside in any meaningful way because it was just happening. So it was then that I realized that Zen, that all Zen is for me is is activity, uh, and that that is that's. I mean, you know, I could get super Zen about that and say like that's all that's all that there is, is, is activity. And, 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 you know, that identity, that holding on to like, who am I and what am I and what is my purpose in life and all that stuff like that, that does, that's counterproductive activity. Uh, and that's all that, that that is for me a lot of the time. But so then you might be asking like, what is that? Like, what is the Jewish part then? And, and is, is, is Jewish being Jewish the same way? Is that just something that I do? And it, it's not, it's, it's, it has its own lens. It has its own vocabulary for talking about that and for feeling it. And that is something that was, that I was raised in. So it has formed and shaped who I am regardless of my affinity for it. And regardless of my, uh, regardless of how voluntarily I'm a part of it, like that, that is that is the, the right place to begin in sort of telling this story is that I I became a seeking person in uh, rebellion against my Jewish upbringing. Uh, not an uncommon story, but I was raised in a conservative Jewish family, and con conservative 
is is a word with a capital C. It means a specific thing. It's it's not you know we were not a conservative family by any sort mm-hmm. of political or you know even um, religious description. It's just that it's a denomination, uh, mm-hmm. but it does have it is a fairly moderate let's put it that way denomination that has a lot of very traditional feeling forms and a lot of material culture and there's just a lot there's a lot to do there's a lot of jewish stuff to do in a conservative family mm-hmm. uh, including hebrew school twice a week so i was i was put into jewish situations all the time and and sort of expected to participate and i thought it was judaism itself that was the problem in retrospect, I think it was really just sort of a lack of conviction or integration or um, maybe some ulterior motive on the part of the adults. It was an insincerity. There were words coming out of people's mouths about God and faith and the world as like being the way it is and who Jews are and what Jews do that sounded very pious, but I didn't really see it reflected in any convincing way in the, in the, in the world that I was in. And I also went to a, to a very small hippie school starting in kindergarten. What had, there were a lot of fair number of Jewish people in the school, but it was, it was a secular, uh, like very, uh, open-minded, and kind of rationalistic school. So it was, I was not being educated to be a, a pious religious person. I was being frequently, but for short bursts of time, put into this weird religious environment that didn't make any sense to me. So, you know, the, the ultimate crucible for any American Jewish kid, I mean, for any Jewish kid, but, you know, for a kid in, in a situation like this where, you know, you're, uh, being exposed to pretty formal Judaism, but also like living in a secular, diverse, pluralistic world. The crucible is always 13, the bar mitzvah preparation process, because you're, you're, you're now expected to do, to perform this long, boring, uh, embarrassing ceremony in front of everyone you've ever met. Uh, and with people watching you to make sure you don't mess up. And there's, there's just, it, there's like months of preparation required just because of the way that the ceremony has become formalized. And, and I, I don't really know, I haven't ever really looked into the origins of this ceremony in its American form. Like there's the requirements, the religious requirements for, for becoming a bar mitzvah, which means like a, a, a ritual adult, like someone who has the, the responsibilities of an adult in religious settings. Uh, are pretty minor. So like this whole getting up on stage and singing in front of everybody thing, like that's an invention of a fairly mm-hmm. recent vintage. And so like, I don't know where that came from or why <laughs> people thought that was good or why people thought that's what children wanted to do. But I sure didn't want to. Uh, and you have to prepare for months to learn all of this stuff. So uh, I began saying very early I don't want to do this. I don't want to have a bar mitzvah. I don't want to be Jewish anymore. And my parents began saying, maybe for the first time ever, like, you have to, you have no choice. Like, this is who you are and you have Mm -hmm. to do it. And I don't know if I fully believed them at the time. I don't know if I fully believed that they believed that that was true or if they were just saying the things that they needed to say in order to get me to do it through you know out of pressure or whatever like whatever it takes to get to get me across that finish line these days i mean this is cheating to fast forward this much but these days i'm quite sure that they were only interested in sort of conforming to expectations that they really didn't care at all whether i believed any of the things that i was doing Mm. uh that that wasn't belief was never really what it was about uh, and, and that may have always been the case. They may, they may have never even said like anything about believing in God or, or all of that religious stuff. They just wanted me to be a Jewish person in a social sense. But I always cared. <laughs> so mm. I was always being told of these things about God by these people that I didn't believe a word coming out of their mouth. And, and I was, rege- I was re- rejecting what I was being taught. I was like, well, how can you say that? Like, that doesn't feel true. So, you know, 
the the point is coming soon where I have to like read the Torah to everybody. And I I started exploring finally outside of the confines of that exp- exploring spirituality. Uh, so I'm what, 12 years old. I'm in like seventh grade at this time. I don't really know where to begin. But the first thing I found, I really wish I knew how, you know, who turned me on to this or whatever, but there was some book that I think I still have somewhere of like solitary Wicca practice. And, and you know, something, I, I think the thing that I picked up on was this Jewish religion as constituted in this sort of half-hearted environment that I'm in is all about text and books and make-believe. It's like completely severed from the world. And here is something that says, if I go into the world, the real world, the world with like life growing in it and the moon and stars and the sun and the sky and like the, 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 thing, the thing that really does seem to be magical and alive about the world, I will find some power and connection there that I've never found in the place where I'm being told to, told that I will find it and being told to find it. And so I snuck out of my house uh, in the middle of the night to the park across the street and did magic and it worked. And so, you know, I, I don't, I don't think I ever even thought like I'm going to cast a spell and, you know, conjure a race car or something, you know, like, I don't know what I wanted in seventh grade, like that I would have done some sort of, um, a, you know, stereotypical magic thing and tried to get. I, I knew that it was just about some connection and energy that I was looking for that I'd never felt. And I did it and I felt it. And I was like, well, there it is. And that the thing, well, but what, what I, what I, what was there when I said there it is was something that I had always known was there that I had always felt. And it just surged forth in me, you know, it came to the foreground and said, here it is. This is the thing. And the, the thing, I mean, that's a really weird way of putting it, but, but I, I, I'd been feeling, let's just for now, since this is the vocabulary I was in, use the word magic. I'd been feeling magic my whole life since I was a child. And for the first time ever, it became clear that I could work with it. And so this began a process of reading all kinds of stuff. The bar mitzvah came and went. Well, I, I convinced my parents to not make me have a bar mitzvah in a conservative synagogue in the United States. We, the, the, compromise that, the compromise that we made was that we would go to Israel and take a trip around the country and see Israel for the first time. And then in Jerusalem at the end, we would have the ceremony, which I could tell was an awesome idea, but I was still, I was still agreeing to in a skeptical way. I, I was suspected of indoctrination a little bit. I suspected they were trying to make me feel things or that, you know, I don't know who they is, but like, you know, the, this, this seemed like a ploy of some kind, but it also seemed vastly superior to go to doing it in front of 500 people in a synagogue. So, you know, cause only my family would be there. It would be like a really small thing. So we did this trip and the, the you know, we had like an independent, we actually left the synagogue that I'd been raised in uh, permanently and we're going to join another one when we got back. And then the, the rabbi who performed the bar mitzvah there was somebody we didn't know, you know, somebody we met there who does this for people. And I, one of the things that's traditional to do uh, at the bar mitzvah is for the, for the, you know, in the modern performance bar mitzvah that we're talking about is, is for the, the, uh, the bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah to give a speech, a, a drash, a, a talk. And I wrote a talk about how I didn't believe in God. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to say that in front of everyone because the Parsha I had, I, I don't actually, this is embarrassing, but I don't remember what Parsha it was, what Torah portion it was, but it was, it was something late in the game that was full of just thunder and, 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 laws and you know it was just god asserting dominance over the people and i was it was just the perfect example of the kind of thing i wasn't into and i wanted to get up and say i don't believe in that and i got to that line in my speech we have this on video i got that to that line in my speech and my voice broke like emotionally 
I wasn't able to say the phrase, I don't believe in God without choking up. Mm. And I did not confront that that had happened for some time after that. Uh, but I remembered it. I kind of remembered it as an embarrassing thing. Like, oh my God, I ruined the, I ruined the, the punchline. You know, like I was so psyched to say that in front of my grandparents and I couldn't get it out. But obviously the significance of that mm. began to settle in after some time ruminating on it. Uh, and I continued my explorations outside of Judaism. And this was around, the, you know, 15 years old, I, I think, give like uh, sometime before the end of high school, I, fa- I read my first book about Buddhism. And I knew that it was about that thing, that there it is feeling. Uh, there it is being, uh, you know, reality. Uh, and that this sitting meditation practice that was being described. It was a book about the Buddha's life, a contemporary book. Um, and the sitting, eyes closed, cross-legged, and realizing that there it is, was a, was a familiar, there was nothing alien or strange about the idea, compared especially to sort of descriptions of, you know, animal sacrifices in the Bible. So uh, I tried it, and it was amazing, and I continued to try it. And that I, I tried it enough by the time I got to college that like that was where I had my first formal encounters with Buddhism and my first Buddhist teachers and we're off to the races. But that's also, college is also where I first met a bunch of Jews who were doing Jewish practice that was alive and embodied and magical. And I learned a lot from them and about how to be Jewish comfortably. And so it was from the very beginning, almost the very beginning, the beginning of formal communal practice in my life, 19, 18, 19 years old, I was doing both at once in equal measure. And that experience was very formative for me because I felt community in something that had felt to that point very solitary. I felt like the path was just something I, was, I had to figure out on my own and it turned out not to be the case. So there are a lot more chapters after that uh, that we can get into, but, but the, the, the basic thing I would say to sort of conclude the how did, this, how did I get like this part is, is that they weaved in and out of each other. Like I had to sort of work on one and work on the other and, tr- and try one by itself and try the other by itself and uh, try other things uh, and see which pieces of these because because religions religions are not simple things religions are not just like one sort of checklist they're 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 whole cultures that that have different ways of participating for different people with different needs and different aptitudes and i had to find mine and you know in some ways i still haven't found mine in judaism i've tried a lot of ways of practicing the jewish religion that that have felt uh, that, that have felt almost there but i'm you know, I've kind of pulled back on that a little bit, except in terms of family life. Uh, but the, the, the Zen practice is feeling super solid for me now. So like maybe now is, now is my chance to explore that some more. It's, it's an ongoing process, as I guess. There's no end to the story, certainly. Totally, totally. Yeah, there's so much in there that I, I would love to ask you about. I, th- I think um, maybe, the, maybe the next thing would be just to ask about um, your teacher and the chapter where you met your teacher and found your sangha and you know you had this description of just um, you know resonating and feeling oh I found it and I'm at home and uh, tell me about that and your teacher and what you really like about him and appreciate and connect to. Yeah, well, the the way I found this sangha <laughs> was by searching Soto Zen Atlanta when I was living in Philadelphia for a year last year in the height of the pandemic. And I had sat, I had sat with the Soto Zen Sangha for just a once a week, totally lay led, like there was no teacher there in Oakland, just a circle of people doing Zazen for half an hour and drinking tea and hanging out. Uh, and, and so I knew I was looking for Soto practice when I started this search. I just didn't know that a mile and a half from the house I grew up in, 
since 10 years before I was born, there had been a an Atlanta Soto Zen Center. <laughs> so wow. I found it pretty quick. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell I'll tell you about how, how I got in with them and how I met Sensei. But the 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 reason I was looking for that was that this these I, I mentioned in college that I sort of found formal Buddhist practice for the first time. There, the I, maybe I should just sort of describe what that was like. I I was I went to Brown University, which I mentioned because there are a lot of people in the sort of meditation world that people know about that are that are there or started there or were there for mm -hmm. some time, uh, including Dr. Willoughby Britton who is a well-known researcher, uh, particularly of the sort of challenges and difficulties and, 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 and dangers, risks of meditation practice. She was uh, a graduate student, PhD student at the time that I was in college. And so she was there and she was part of this mix. But the, the advisor to the group of students that I was learning with was a professor of East Asian studies and religious studies named Hal Roth, Harold Roth, and Dharma named Kendo Hal Roth. Uh, and he, uh, he was at the time having a lot of trouble getting an initiative called the contemplative studies initiative off the ground. Uh, he was getting, he was booking lots of speakers. He had the buy-in of the medical school as a sort of the medical school had, had, I don't know what they called them exactly, but, but in addition to the core stuff that you're learning for your medical discipline, they had some other kind of liberal arts track for everyone and contemplative studies had officially become one of those but he was trying to teach this to undergraduates and the, and the, the religious studies department wouldn't have him because it involved practicing meditation and that was you know like we're academics we study things from a completely disinterested remove by reading books we don't actually do things that would be un, that would be unscientific of us uh so the religious studies department wouldn't have him so he had to sort of cobble it together and the students who wanted to study this had to cobble it together too. We had to declare independent concentrations. Uh, and that's what I did. Um, I, I, I created an independent concentration in music, the musical version of contemplative studies. Um, I just wanted to study the sort of Buddhism and meditation part, but because of the nature of the bureaucracy, we had to create an, a unique thing every time. We all had to come up with some unique spin on it. So I was like, fine, you want me to do, to like play guitar as part of my major? Then sure, I will. Um, so I studied contemplative music as, as part of, part of the, uh, the course of study, but, but the, the core classes on Taoism and Buddhism uh, formed the kind of contemplative backbone of what we were, you know, it was almost like a research Thing. We practiced Zazen and we used the perspective we were cultivating in that practice to examine this material from the inside instead of from the outside. Um, so Hal was a Rinzai initiate. He had studied uh, with Joshu Sasaki Roshi and which is a pretty, you know, he was in Japan for seven years or something like that. Whoa. And uh, he, he was a very serious Rinzai teacher uh he you know we chanted the hanya shingyo in japanese and like you know this was an you know it was a little it was a little intense for me as you know especially in the sort of flowering jewish period of my life to be doing this practice that i read about in this book as this very personal thing in this uh, in such a formal way but i knew that zen was working for me zen that it's it's non-conceptual way of relating to the practice itself was very comfortable for me, not not I mean not comfortable in terms of easy or relaxing. It was it was the right methodology for me. I could tell, but I found his insistence on koan practice to be overly mentally active for me, and I also found that sitting with my eyes open just was better practice for me, and he wasn't making us do things the Rinzai way, but he was kind of maybe unconsciously teaching about Soto as sort of not the way he likes to talk about things or do things. Mm -hmm. But that was my, so my exposure to Soto Zen was like, oh, but there's this other way to do it that I could be doing that feels like it has something for me that, that, that I'm not getting from this way of practicing. So, and there were some Soto teachers who came uh, particularly Zoketsu Norman Fisher Roshi from California, who's a luminary of 
Soto Zen and also a proud practicing Jew. So like that, that was a huge influence on me when he came for a couple of days. Um, but I, and then I, you know, I, I sort of had in the back of my mind, like maybe if I found a Soto teacher, I would find, I would, I would, I would be, uh, I, w- I would be less wayward in my approach to this. And so then I, you know, years later in California, I sat with these people in Oakland that were, uh, John Tarrant Roshi was the name of their lineage, the teacher of their lineage. I don't know anything about that lineage, actually. And like I said, they didn't have a teacher there. So, you know, he seemed like a beautiful writer and we read some stuff by him and it was appealing. Uh, but it wasn't until a lot of years after that, you know, w- when I'm getting ready to move back home to Atlanta in the midst of the pandemic that I thought, um, now's the time we had a second kid on the way things were getting super real in my life. And I, and I was like, now it's, it's kind of now or never in terms of building the foundation for the rest of my life as this practice. And I, this thing has been following me around for long enough. I've done enough sort of non-aligned Zazen in the last 15 years that I, that I think that it's time to settle down. So I Googled Atlanta Soto Zen found that Atlanta Soto Zen Center was a thing. Uh, and <laughs> then the, you know, and I looked into them and immediately saw like, wow, there's a teacher here who's been here for a long time. And he, he has a very interesting lineage. And I, uh, I, I didn't really know anything actually about the Sawaki Uchiyama Okamura Roshi lineage, which is not our root lineage, but is, is the, uh, the lineage that gave my teacher his formal Dharma transmission to become a, 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 a by the book Soto Zen teacher who could train other Soto Zen teachers. Hmm. And, and, and I started reading about them and found them instantly uh, like the, the thing I'd been looking for in terms of rigor and focus on Zazen and, and the, the sort of democratic but serious form of Zazen that they teach in that lineage. Meaning they don't hold back in terms of like, you should sit Zazen a lot, very in, with, with a lot of effort all the time, but everyone should and householders should. And it doesn't, it monastic people don't have special access to Zazen. Like everyone should do that much Zazen. And, you know, that might've been a little bit extreme at various times, but you know, it, it, the, the rigor appealed to me. But then I looked into who is this Matsuoka Roshi character that, that my teacher learned all this from and, uh, and, and what's up with that? And also why didn't he ordain this guy? And I learned that it was because he was an iconoclastic person. He was, he was a teacher who didn't really care about paperwork. He cared about Zen as a, as a lifestyle <laughs> and uh, you know welcomed everyone to it and also loved America and the West and, and came here because he thought Zen had died in Japan and wanted to come somewhere where he could, where he could be reborn. And he came in, uh, in, in the, in the 19, in, oh, I can't remember now. It, in, it was like 1931 or something. Uh, it, it was, it was, it was so early. Oh, it was 39. He came in 1939. The reason that I remember is because I remember how being struck by how close to the start of the war it was. Uh, and the fact that he got out of there before things got super bad in Japan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I mean, they'd already had gotten bad, but like before it became, let's take over the world bad. Uh, and he came to America and for to 10 years or so, he ministered to Japanese Americans, but he, event- he eventually founded a center in Chicago and that's where Sensei found him. And so there was this very interesting story behind this lineage. And the, the fact that I hadn't heard of it was interesting. And then I, then I realized it's because it was so old that in American Buddhism terms that it predated the hippies. Like there were no hippies around in the 1940s to, to like sort of popularize Zen in the, in the way that it, that, that it eventually did happen in California and became the sort of big Soto Zen lineages in America that, that everybody dr- name drops. Um, not that the, that the Okamura Roshi lineage in, is really one of those either. They stayed in Japan until the 70s. Uh, so uh, 
there was this sort of side thing happening where like Sir it, what it felt to me was that serious Zen was happening and it had intentionally stayed away from the hippie stuff and the, 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 um, the spiritual materialism that I had associated with American Buddhism uh, as a, um, you know, as a, as a, a phenomenon and a cultural phenomenon. And that was interesting to me. So I looked into who is this teacher who is, who is Michael Elliston Roshi. And he, well, he was a hippie in a way. He was a designer. He was an art a teacher at the Art Institute in Chicago. And he, so he was an artist. So it's not really fair to say that he was a hippie, but he was, you know, a psychedelic 60s person who then found a fascination with Zen. And the, uh, the, uh, the, the, there wasn't, there wasn't a clash. There wasn't, there wasn't a, a, a cultural problem between him and Matsuo Kuroshi. Matsuo Kuroshi was, was very open-minded and accepting of weird people. Uh, but since I sat with this, with this teacher for such a long time that Zen really became uh, the source of endless creativity and inspiration for him. Like he, he moved away from the psychedelic world that he may have come from because he found more in Zen. And you know, I, no need to recap his sort of whole story. He, he, he eventually, he was not the eldest, he was not the senior student of Matsuo Kuroshi. So uh, another teacher, another guy in his sort of cohort took over the center in Chicago and uh, Elson Roshi, well, he wasn't, he wasn't ordained yet at the time. Uh, Sensei decided to move to Atlanta to found a new center in the middle of, uh, well, he just had a, he had a job here. He brought him here and he decided to, to found a center here too. And through all kinds of remarkable work, he ended up founding something that became an order of Soto Zen in Matsuo Kuroshi's lineage. There are now centers in other places. None of them are as, as, as up and running. I mean, it's funny to put it that way. It's not like Atlanta Soto Zen Center is some like huge institution with, with like salaried staff members. And like, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a very, it's a very humble temple, but there's a lot of people and a lot of energy and the yeah. other centers are smaller, but we had this hub model where teachers come here and get trained by sensei and go other places. And so there's a network that's formed. It's not just in the States, it's in Canada and Europe and um, maybe other places. And we had these Japanese roots. And so we, you know, the, the teachers have gone to Japan and sort of reconnected with everybody. The Sotoshu is well aware of our activity and thinks it's great. And so I wanted to be part of a lineage like that in order to put down roots. And I contacted them and, and started zooming in from Philadelphia. Uh, you know, I was doing the morning zazen that they do uh, with another group, uh, which was at 7.30 in the morning or something. Uh, I was calling in for that. That was sort of my first way of participating. And then they have Sunday uh, ceremony and Dharma talks that I was going to. And I, I met a lot of people that way. And when we moved here, I... I mean, I was, I've been looking forward to moving here the whole time. Large, I mean, I grew up here. It's, 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 you know, I've been looking forward to getting home for all kinds of reasons, but now I had this community uh, mm -hmm. of practice and I couldn't wait to get back. And I still feel that way because the Zendo is not still not open, but we're getting there. And mm -hmm. so, you know, by this point I've developed, and I, I sit Dogasan with Sensei every week when I can, I, I, I've, I mean, I, he was the first, his podcast was the first one we got up and running. So I've worked with him for a year on this intense creative project. And I feel really, really at home and a part of this lineage. And, and, and as a, I, I feel like, like a devoted student of, of him now. Mm. And the, uh, he's 80 years old, you know, like he's been, he's been, he's been doing this a long time. And I, I'm grateful for every minute that I get to learn from him and we'll see where this is all going, but it still really just feels like the beginning of mm. my involvement in something. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that I've still never sat Zazen in that Zendo before I've you know, mm. been there when no one else was there and, you know, uh, moved stuff around with him or, you know, what, it, you know, had a short conversations outside, but you know, the Zendo, the plan is the, 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 the reopening plan has begun to, to, or we started talking about it. We, I mean, like the board has started talking about it and I'm eager for that to happen because I built up so much uh, around this and, and sitting 
but I've been sitting at home the whole time and getting in there and sitting with these people. It's going to blow my mind. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Can you tell me about, um, you know, you described yourself as a, as a devoted student and that that's really, really shines through. And um, I, I personally admire that kind of devotion to a teacher and it's been helpful to me in my own training. And mm. I'm curious, and this is something that I've been curious about for a while um, about the qualities of a teacher and the way that they show up and how a student perceives them. And, and I'm curious about like, what what you see in him that speaks to you and resonates for you what qualities you see him demonstrating that are inspiring and, and important to you right now mm. well some of it was a gut feeling that i feel like developed in you know develops in the first 30 seconds of meeting mm -hmm. someone like mm -hmm. most of our gut feelings about people do yeah which was about how important to him the I, I was I was I was looking for something about the intensity of what of of the student teacher relationship for him and I was looking for a low intensity I didn't want mm. it to I didn't want it to feel like the kind of fervor that I had encountered to some extent in the Jewish world and that I was aware people had, well aware by this time in my 30s, uh, that people had for their Buddhist teachers. I was not looking for that. I was not looking mm -hmm. for like uh, a, a passion, a torrid, passionate relationship with a guru. I was mm -hmm. looking for a coach, you know, mm -hmm. someone who had been where I have, where I am, and 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 had a path that reminded me of mine, and that looks like one that might. That, that I could imagine being where I'm going. And I felt that immediately. It had to do with, it had to do with his creativity, his, his, his way, his, his very sensuous aesthetic way of talking. He was, he, was, he was seeing a lot of beauty and detail in things, including, you know, Zazen itself that he wanted to relate in, in a, in a beautiful way. And that just spoke to me as a, as a, as a, I mean, I, I personal expression has always been an aspect of this path. This, there it is that I mentioned at the beginning was very personal and, and, and also seemed to be something to do with what I am here to do and how I am here to show up. And that that's a that's up you know that's on me that's up to me to manifest what that is, and, and that can that that resulted in a lot of creative or artistic practice. But what I what all I really mean by that is like being radically being myself. Be like it it doesn't it doesn't feel like something that's coming from me. It's not like I'm expressing my own ideas. It's that I am something, and I have to get out of the way of being that. So that it can be the 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 manifestation of me in the world, and there's there's that's what I mean by creative. It's kind of it's really hard to explain, but that but that to me feels like creativity itself. Like I am being created by my creativity, and he t he talked about it in the same way. It, it's it, if you don't get what I mean, just like know that being an artist is a pretty good indication of being this way that to me that or be, being this way in the way that I am it's like you you are things are coming through all the time and that's what he was describing but he was but but he had the sort of eh, you know if, if it's good it's good and if it sucks it sucks and I'll crumple it up and do a new one that you have mm -hmm. to have in order to be in order to make enough to become talented so that and that also was was a was was his attitude about zazen that that it that it was about drawing a million circles on a piece of paper until they're all round you know and that showed up in other ways too i mean he he's he works in wood a lot and and other other physical media and i don't 
but I wish I did, you know? And so like see, seeing that as a thing, as a way that he uh, grounded the expression of who he is into the material world uh, was also encouraging to me. So basically what I saw was somebody who is, whose hands are dirty in the world all the time and who isn't, you know, like two toes left on the ground floating off into the stratosphere, uh, which was a which was a world that I had been in for a long time. Not me personally, but I was surrounded by people like that. So fi finding a finding a very grounded here present person was a crucial thing. And so then, once you find that person, the test is: can they talk about it, or are they boring? And you know, I've, I've met enough Zen people who refuse to use language in such a way that it doesn't really feel like they are concealing something but rather that they're just not in touch with it in the first place. And so I needed to see through conversation with him how this, how willing he is to sort of share. And he was extremely willing. And when I would say the weirder a thing I said, the more interested he became. And mm -hmm. that, was, that was really reassuring. Um, and then, the, then there's there's other sort of biographical things that mattered. Like he had he had been married. He has children. They're you know obviously long grown now. But but he he kind of had some unfinished business when it comes to family life that he was very keen to make sure that I avoid mm -hmm. having. Uh, and and that sort of life path stuff seemed really important to me too. I didn't want to be with a teacher who had only ever been inside a monastery. And the, uh, because that wasn't for a long time, I had known that that wasn't going to be what my life was going to be like. And so I, so basically I was looking for a household or Sangha and I found one and he, he had founded it. And so that was, that was, uh, well, and then the other piece of that is that I met other people in the Sangha. Who does this person attract? Mm -hmm. And every single person was uh was someone i wanted to know and that was enough of a sign about who shows up to learn from this person so it's only been borne out in ways that but like in more powerful ways than i could have expected but my my instincts were pretty were were, were pretty honed but but they were but it was also just about feeling natural I, just by checking in with whether or not this felt like the right place to be and the right person to be talking to um, in a way that's not unlike that. That's I mean, in, a, in a way that, that I do with everyone I meet. Uh, I was able to be confident enough to keep showing up until I knew for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing all that. I, I, a part of the reason I ask is there, there is such this feeling in my life that I've had a few times of like, I'm coming home to mm. a teacher and a tradition and a, a community. And um, it's beautiful to hear you describe your experience of that. So um, I wanna ask about, um, you know, you said you were looking for a householder Sangha and you found that and also, um, you know, talked about the specific uh, blend of lineages that form that Sangha and how, um, you know, there's this emphasis on Zazen and even for householders that it's not limited to monastics. and you know, also your your uh, pinned tweet on Twitter is is about um, you know domesticity is the new monasticism, and uh, frankly, I think that that has been uh, a bit of a koan for me of mm -hmm. seeing that tweet from you. Like, wow, like what what do I want in my own life, and is it monastic training or household life, and um, why, and what is best for me? And so, I would really be curious to ask you about that and. What, what that tweet means to you and how you practice that in your own life. Well, part of what motivated that tweet was releasing myself from the common householder Zen yearning for monastic life mm. because it seems more Zen. It's hard, it's hard to even encapsulate what it seems more of, but, it, <laughs> but it, but once, when you get a taste of Zen practice, when, well, I should speak for myself, but I know that this is a thing that many, many lay practitioners go through. When I, get, when I got a taste of how Zen is life, 
it it made complete sense to me that I would make Zen my entire material life. And I never could. And I eventually made lots of decisions that made it impossible. And but that was but there was a point, you know, around this point where I joined the Sangha and where the second kid was coming, where I recognized like, well, this this is well and truly impossible now. <laughs> like there's there's no there is no world in like a barring utter tragedy befalling me there is no world in which it's possible for me to take that path so i needed to release that but i couldn't do it or didn't even know i needed to release it until i realized that i had joined a lay a sangha as a lay person as a householder with a family uh and the the and we were all locked in here together <laughs> Uh, and I was experiencing dramatic acceleration of both the rigor and intention of my practice compared to ever before. It's more zazen, more participation, you know, altar service, which is never something I had wanted to do before. All of that was just coming online. And I was carrying Zen into the rest of this life in a way that, that as much as I may have told myself I understood was the way Zen works, had never really happened. There, there, was, there was never, some of it was that I had never really familiarized myself with the body sensations of practice in such a way that I could still feel them afterwards. And, but, but I'm also quite sure that I was that the states of my body were changing as a result of this practice that and in, in, in ways that were, uh, that were not limited to a sitting posture. So I, as I began to encounter like the insanity of two little kids and, and, and lockdown and the professional turmoil in my house and, and all this stuff, in a Zen mode of being, I began to realize something about monastic life. I also read some stuff. I read a few accounts of, uh, uh, there's one book from the 90s that I don't remember the name of or the name of the person, but it was, it's a Japanese book that was translated into English of a guy who went as a 20 something to Eiheiji for I think one year, but like did the sort of the, the height of Soto Zen monastic life as, as, a, as a person who wasn't trained and, and went through the rigors of that. And I read that book and uh, you know, there were a few other just personal accounts that I, that I was trying to read to get a sense of what Soto monastic life is like. Also reading a lot of Chinese stuff, old stuff about the the, 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 the people and places where these practices formed in the first place, I was trying to get a felt sense of, of what went into creating the practice that I'm doing uh, and reading about monastery life as a result of that search and realizing that the things they were going through, yes, like hours a day of zazen, that's, that's its own thing, but cooking and cleaning and interpersonal tension and all of the stuff that was really doing the work, it seemed, was the same stuff that mm -hmm. I was that was happening to me. Now there are clearly there are differences. I I would I would give my left arm for the amount of structure and schedule that you have in a monastery. Sometimes, given the the tornado that that is a, a day in the life in my house, just because that's my nature. Uh, and I I feel much more held in a in a in a in a structured in a in a scheduled environment where I know what's going to happen when, and 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 once I realized that I was missing that so badly, some of it is also that I was used to like a career life where where like the work day schedule um, created that structure in my life and it, that that was gone, so. Once I realized that I was missing that, I started to be able to tune into what this chaos was like in my house and realize that 
the, 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 the ways I would structure that time would artificially impose kind of long stretches of the same thing happening instead of moment to moment, like something new every second that I needed to inhabit fully in order to handle before the next thing came along. And that, I finally realized that that rigor is, I mean, that that is just as rigorous. Well, I mean, what I realized is that everything is rigorous. <laughs> like there, there is no, there is no, un, that, like you can, you can choose to not address life rigorously. But if you do address your life, you have to do it really rigorously. So, and this is, this, this is, you know, on some level, kind of an obvious sort of mysticism uh, approach to things like uh, it's all Zen practice. It's all like monastic life and householder life are exactly the same. And that's not what I mean. What I mean is they are, they are different forms of training the same rigor. And, but there's one more element to what I mean by domesticity is the new monasticism, which is that I don't think it's realistic for the vast majority of the people who will comprise the Zen Sangha in the world in the coming, in our generation to have a monastic life. And how can we have real rigorous Zen in the world if the vast majority of people aren't able to practice in the real rigorous Zen way? And my assertion, though I don't think I'm the first person to ever assert this, and I think there are plenty of Zen teachers going back a hundred years who have said the same thing. It, my assertion is that we all are practicing with the same rigor and what we need to do as householders is relate to our household as a temple. And, and that, that is not at all to invalidate mon monastic practice as a path for people who need monastic practice. And in fact, I think it's to revere it more because what because the divide the seeming divide between householder and monastic in buddhist history is that householders are unserious and so you know assuming like perfect buddhist culture reverence for the proper order of things you know householders look up to monks because monks are doing the practice almost for them and mm -hmm. the householders are there to support them but re and in, in, in a society like ours it's like there's almost the opposite attitude People have people think monastics are running away from life, or they think you're, you know, like how, like, like I, I can't do that. I have a job, you know, like, like that, like that's not realistic. And the truth is that the that that rigorous engagement with your householder life will show you that some people need monastic practice, and and it might be you, <laughs> but if it's not, the 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 rigor will demonstrate to you that you are getting monastic practice that you're that you're doing i mean it's it's not I mean, it's pointless to say it that way but you're you're getting you're 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 getting zen training from your life my teacher said when my second daughter was born you got a new zen teacher now and i just you know as much as i thought like that was a wise thing to say for teacher sensei you know i thought he was just saying it <laughs> But what he but he was he was he was almost like abdicating his responsibility as my teacher, like on purpose mm -hmm. at, by saying that he was saying, like, I'm not going to teach you a tiny fraction of what your ba new baby's going to teach you. Mm -hmm. And he was absolutely right. Mm -hmm. You know, I just need to sit with him and process what's happening. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. I'm, and thank God he's there so that I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to. Um, sort of reflect, um, maybe maybe like translate that a little bit to my own experience because I, I really resonate with what you're saying and had to. I, I think my own in my own life I've come at a similar conclusion, um, maybe, but I'd put it slightly differently, and I, I just imagine it might be useful for someone listening. Of like, basically, that every situation that you're in is an opportunity and an opportunity to train or develop and cultivate some skill set and that you know it might not be um you might not be doing monastic training you might not consider yourself even a zen or buddhist practitioner but like you are already training 
or cultivating something and you are in a situation that affords certain opportunities to grow and it's like you have a choice to bring to consider it that way or not and if you do then then you can grow and, and cultivate different capacities does that does that match what you're Absolutely. trying to say yeah i mean i i'm also saying that you that if what you want is to be trained in zen mm -hmm. householder life provides the level of rigor necessary to become a, the fullest expression of a zen practitioner that you that 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 is available mm -hmm. so it's so i am saying something more specific mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. but it's it's based on that principle that yeah. that all of life is training for it to mm -hmm. be what you are yes yes so let's talk about your training like what what does your life look like and how do you try to embody or practice or cultivate this this zen tradition you know being a jewish person with a family two kids what does that look like for you both both like on a day-to-day -day level and like how do you approach it what how do you see that what does it actually what does it mean for you mm -hmm. I didn't know that it was going to be possible to have the level of daily practice. And I, and I just mean level in terms of hours mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. that, that I have now mm -hmm. uh, after my kids were born. And I think I learned that I was looking at training exactly wrong before <laughs> that happened. Um, and it has something to do with that sort of householder versus monastic stuff that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that training was preparation mm -hmm. that, that I, that the thing, the thing that I would need to do if I wanted to have a solid Zen practice before my life got too crazy is do hours a day of Zazen when there was nothing to distract me when I was single or when I was, when we had, when we didn't have kids and that that would prepare me, I would take advantage of the freedom that I had to prepare myself for life when it got crazy. Of course, I never did that. I never used my freedom that way. Mm -hmm. And that is something that I, had a tendency to relate to in a guilty way, or relate to in a sort mm -hmm. of self-judging, self-critical way. But what I think I've learned, first what I learned is that the wise being inside me somewhere is going to take care of this problem. It's not, it's not some, it's not an executive function issue. It's, 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 it was a, it was a, it was a misunderstanding entirely. And that when things got to the point in my life where rigorous Zen practice was what I needed in order to be ready, it happened to me. So the search for the Sangha, the sort of carving out of time very early in the morning in, uh, you know, like that, that all, that's all stuff I did on a sort of bottom of Maslow's hierarchy level, you know, like it wasn't, it wasn't a self-realization thing or whatever it is. It wasn't like now I have, now that I've got a job and freedom and what everything, now I can concentrate on the spiritual life. It was the exact opposite of that. It was like, if I don't take an hour to myself, I will go insane. Uh -huh. So let's start by doing that. And the, 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 the practice immediately became to me like a gift that I was giving myself. Mm. So then what I realized is that fitting, like, so that has to be there is what I realized first. And, that, and, and, and I don't mean, and it doesn't have to be there before. There is no before. We like, we like to say, you know, in, on Sangha Twitter, there's a lot of people who are kind of cheeky about enlightenment or, you know, like progress as a, mm. as a, as a like a linear temporal direction to your practice where like you're here and you're gonna get there someday like there are a lot of ways uh to laugh about that idea and my preferred way is that there is no like there, there, there's no time to be enlightened other than right now so hmm. there's no being enlightened later it's not too late to be enlightened for your life to happen like now is all that there is so the the 
the first thing I figured out was that in the midst of life being crazy is when the when training happens. So once I gave myself that gift, then a more intricate kind of work to fit to blend to fit things together started to happen, like adjustments of time and time start like when in the day to do this and 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 where in the house to do it and um you know solving all those practical problems of how am i going to fit this together how is how is it going to is it going to create a burden on my wife or my children you know like the 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 other people like am i going to get everything done that i need to get done in, to take care of them to take care of whatever else i need to take care of you know i had to solve all those problems but seeing it as a and I mean, I don't want to be dramatic and make it sound like it's a survival need, but like seeing it as a necessity, feeling it as a necessity really changed the way that I, the, the sacrifices I was willing to make for the training. So I've always been a, an early riser. I was saying to you before we started recording that, that there's that the, the feeling that, well, that it's been a long day already and it's still morning, mm -hmm. uh, but that's how I like things. I, I like mm -hmm. to, to, to front load my day. So the, this combined with a realization that if I was going to do the amount of Zazen that I felt like I needed to do, and that's, there's a lot of questions there. I'm sure we could, we could break into also. Um, I would need to do it first thing. And also, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why I want to do Zazen first thing. I want to, I want to head off sort of like a busy activity by doing in my practice first, but, but there a much more urgent practical matter came up, which is if everyone, if anyone's awake, when I'm doing this much practice, like I'm not going to be able to do it. So mm -hmm. I've, I have found sort of progressively earlier awake times. And I, and, and what I decided was like, I'm going to go to bed early, even though the only time I get to quote unquote, chill out is after my kid goes to sleep. I'm, you know, both kids now go to sleep. Um, I'm going to give up that time to go to bed early so that I can wake up and do this. It wasn't, it was a no brainer. Uh, and so I now wake up at five in the morning in order to do a uh, long and involved multi-step practice that also includes 50 minutes straight of seated Zazen. Mm -hmm. um, and there's other stuff too. And I do all of that. It's a progressively more active process. It's sitting and then it's walking, which is, traditional Soto Zen, Kim Hin walking meditation, then chanting and the sort of like ma altar maintenance candle stuff, like little fine motor skills. And then a uh, Qigong sequence that I've been learning that is uh, sort of the way I move all of the energy raised in that sort of progressively more active practice and going from Qigong movement into like at the rest of the day feels like a pretty like it's it all feels like pretty small steps mm. um changes so mm. so that that sort of gradual change of the of the kind of movement and thinking and feeling that's happening really contributes to that seamless quality of of going into the next thing of zen practice and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing so that is the core of it i will do more if I can, uh, because the way that it started to feel is, and I don't know how common this is, but I don't really hear people talk about it this way, is, is, is that there's, there's a muscle memory component to, I mean, that, that's a little bit of a metaphor. I mean, I do mm -hmm. literally feel it in my muscles, but, I, but there, there's, a, there's a, a memory, a body of short-term memory that is settled in in practice that then is accessible in the rest of the day. And if I were, I haven't, it's been over a year now since I have missed my morning practice, but the, well, I, there have been days where I didn't do it in the morning because for example, our baby had been born the night before, but sure. you know, like the, the, I, I would always find a time within a 24, I did have always found a time in the past year in, within a 24 hour period to do some Zazen at least. Uh, 20 minutes is what counts as some for me. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, but the, the, there are only, only been a few of those days, like most mm -hmm. of the days and I'm, I'm mm -hmm. really getting to do this whole sequence or at least do half of it and then do the other half later. Um, but the, the, uh, I say that because I, I would imagine 
if I were to not do it, I would be, I would feel really weird now. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and even for a day. And that was the goal. I wanted to get to the point where it was like brushing my teeth. When I set out this year to be like, I'm going to develop a daily practice and it's going to be a rigorous one. Brushing my teeth was the sort of ex metaphor that I wanted to use because I didn't want to relate to Zen practice as a moral obligation, as a commandment, like the way that the religion I was raised in relates to daily practice. I wanted to relate to it as something that was good for me that if I didn't do it, my body would feel strange so that I would do it again tomorrow. <laughs> because when I related to it as something that I had to do that was like dependent on streaks or like consistency or something, if I broke it, there's, I'm sure lots of things work. Exercise works like this, diet works like this. If I broke it one day, I'd be like, well, shit. There it goes. <laughs> there it goes. I'm done. I'm not a Zen practice. I'm not a Zen practitioner anymore. You know, like that was I, any excuse I could get to stop, I would use. So I didn't want it to be like that from the get-go this time. I wanted it to become something that was so inculcated into me that I would feel the lack of doing it in order to do it again. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's part of also why it's so important to sit to, for my practice to be first thing in the morning because it carries me through the rest of the day. So if my kids wake up in the middle of it, this is I, got, I did a Q&A the other day on Twitter because I got to 365 days. And I, you know, so many people on Twitter, on this sort of Sangha Twitter that we were talking about at the beginning are trying to build a practice that I, and many of them are trying to build it from scratch. They're not trying to build it from within a tradition uh, that they're, they're, they're using all kinds of, you know, sort of techie productivity ways to get into it. I understand that. I used to really be like that in a lot of aspects of my life. Um, they're looking for tips and tricks on how to make it stick. And so I did this Q&A sort of thinking like maybe people will, will, will find some uh, advice in, in sort of me telling, my, telling about how this, how this goes. Um, uh, oh, I actually forgot what I was going to say about that. But the, 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 it was something that I, 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 gave, I gave somebody the answer that I was looking for <laughs> just now. Um, but the, the, oh, right. So I got a lot of questions about, okay, so you say you've got, kids at home, you, you've got a wife, like, uh, you know, how, how do they handle all of this? And, and, and uh, it's an understandable question. And so the first part is like, they're asleep for all of this, uh, if all goes according to plan. Like that was never, mm -hmm. I was never going to take time away from them in order to do the practice. Uh, so there's that, but then there's, there's another obvious question, which is like, what if the kids wake up? Who, mm -hmm. who, who deals with that? Does your wife wake up and deal with it or do you deal with it? And, and the answer is I deal with it. And so that's actually the hardest thing about my practice right now is getting up to go upstairs and take care of a kid if they wake up in the middle of it. And that's hard for a lot of reasons that you can imagine. I mean, I don't really want to get into the emotions of what it feels like to feel like my children are interrupting me uh, doing what I want to do, uh, like so quickly, like I I'm happy to talk about that. It's just like, it's a little hard to, mm -hmm. hard to get into. Um, but the, the part of the practice of that is not, not feeling interrupted and continuing to practice through dealing with that. And then another part is like, okay, well, a contingency has emerged. How do I adjust to this new reality and still do my practice in the way that feels complete. So, you know, I've started to uh, realize that the Qigong movement is the sort of non-negotiable part. If mm. I've done 20 minutes of Zazen and then everything goes to hell, it's okay if I don't get to do more. If I don't get to do 20 minutes, I'm gonna find time to do 20 minutes of Zazen later, uh, hopefully more. Uh, but, but if, if, if that's all I get in the morning, I just, I need to find time to do my Qigong sequence at some mm -hmm. point, hopefully as early as possible. That's the thing that, that has to come with me. So the, the other key thing, this is the last thing I'll say about, about this question. The other key thing that I'm learning to do because of this flexibility is not reify the structure of the practice as a sacred or necessary 
or fundamentally real thing. It's a support structure. And part of what is supportive about it is its ability to adapt to my life as it is. And learning which pieces of it need to happen in order to feel like I have integrated and which parts of it can go and I can let go of, that's a really valuable aspect of this training for me. And, 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 I, and part of it, I'm not sure how deep this actually goes, but part of it does seem, there's a baby crying, I don't know if you can hear. Yeah. Um, part, don't worry, there's someone with her. Okay. <laughs> but uh, part of what I think that's doing for me is it's unwinding certain rigid forms of religious obligation mm. that I got from my Jewish upbringing, where if you don't do the thing, you're in trouble with God and have to apologize. Mm -hmm. And Judaism provides ways to apologize. So it's like, it's okay. And actually what I've come to see about that, about this repentance aspect of Judaism is that that actually is the part that works, like works in terms of like bringing you closer to the divine. Feeling humbled enough to do that is the absolutely essential part. And it's, and I, it's almost as though the positive commandments actually just exist to set you up to screw them up so mm -hmm. that you apologize to God. And like a lot of, a lot, I mean, that, that's not a very orthodox way of, of looking at it, but, but I think it is still a legitimate traditional way of looking at it. And, and I do see it that way. And that, and that, but that's, that's, that's one thing. If that's your whole life, if your whole life is a built around these commandments as a way to structure your life and the sort of service relationship to God around those commandments and the, and the, 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 what you do, if you don't live up to them, is your practice like that's one thing but that's not how it is for me so the the flexibility of this knowing what really does matter and what doesn't what really doesn't matter if i don't if i don't get to do it like that heals that part of me mm -hmm. uh, slowly <laughs> yeah uh, there's a lot in there that's like really personally inspiring to me and also um helpful of yeah, hear, hearing that you talk about that just now of like how it's healing this sort of like have to do it this way kind of mentality to like what's actually needed and possible. And um, I don't know, just I'm incredibly impressed and grateful for you that you uh, have been able to do your practice over the last year. And you're like, yeah, I, I had a child born and then I found 20 minutes to practice. <laughs> it's like, that's in incredible the yeah. in the hospital. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I was also really surprised by hearing you say that. Um, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, but that you sort of build from stillness into motion because mm. a lot of, uh, well, I'm, I'm sort of structuring my routine currently from the opposite direction of like start with motion and then go into stillness um, mm. because, well, just for me and, and it, like I find in the mornings, like I tend to be, uh, like it would be easy to just sit there and like, like I've learned how to sleep while being, while sitting. So it would be easy <laughs> to just like go into dullness essentially. But if mm. I do the Tai Chi or Qigong first, it really, um, makes the sitting more more of a useful time period for me. Um, but that makes sense. Like you're, you're like, I wanna bring this into the rest of the day. How can I uh, do that? And ending with the Qigong is fascinating. Um, hmm, hmm. Well, what, what kinds of, what kinds of um, I'm curious about the family dynamics there. Like what kinds of uh, adjustments have you had to make besides the ones that you've already mentioned and like uh, negotiating with your wife and like, you know, I, I guess if you're sleeping, if she's sleeping, it's. I imagine it's all good, but I'd be curious to hear more about how that works sort of strategically. Yeah. The, I mean, she, she's actually long past the point where she'll pressure me. I mean, this, it has, it's been a year, like I said, since, since there's been a stretch of not doing mm -hmm. Dazen, but we'd been together for six, five, six years before that. So mm -hmm. you know, she'd, she'd seen me in it and seen me out of it. And, and she had long since been at the point where she would make me start sitting again if I, if I hadn't been. So, you know, Lesser. no problem, no problems there. I mean, it was, uh -huh. I'm not going to say it was self-interested, but it was clearly like about me, yes. how I'm showing up and wanting me to show up like this. So, uh, you know, that, 
I'm really grateful for that. There, there is there is negotiation for sure, but it has it's much it's on a much more um, logistical basis. Mm-hmm. It's not really about my personal practice. It's kind of just about when are we doing Judaism together and when are you doing Buddhism by yourself, <laughs> which which is which is complicated. Um, it's it's it. There's a lot there's a lot to get into there actually, mm-hmm. but I mean sort of finishing out finishing out sort of the part about my household and my family, the kids, uh, well, the baby's not really very uh, interested in the ideas yet, uh, mm-hmm. but, but uh, our, our eldest is two and a half, and she is really interested in ritual, I think is how I would put it. And that's clearly what we wanted. I mean, we've been doing Jewish rituals with her for a long time, but she's gotten a sense of what my practice is enough to be curious about it. Sitting still, not so much a thing that she loves to do for more than a second or two, mm-hmm. um, though we have found ways of working that in. I don't know where my wife got this, but the, but we have instead of doing time out, we have a time in practice. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that's some popular thing, <clears throat> but the way that the way that that looks is we have an hourglass with purple sand in it. That's two minutes long. And she, there's a corner that she goes to and she goes with one of us. And so we sit together quietly until the two minutes are up and she can do whatever she wants in those two minutes, but not talk to us. She has to do it by herself. Um, so she will play with the toy sometimes, but she'll also just watch the hourglass the whole two minutes. Uh, and so like, that's, that's, that's promising to me. Um, but, but the, the stuff she really likes is she likes the Buddha statues on my altar and she likes the, the chanting. And so we do that together sometimes. And it's just like a musical experience for her, I think. But she kind of gets, she uses the, she talks about the Buddha and she talks about Zazen and she talks about sensei, you know, like she, she's sort of figuring out who these characters are. And just before I give the sense that I'm privileging that in any way, like she also says the blessings with us over the candles at Shabbat. And she's like into Jewish life in the exact same way. And I don't think she really, I, I actually do think she knows the difference but maybe just in terms of like sonic, like aesthetics, like she can tell when Hebrew is happening and she can tell, you know, mm. like that it's, it's just like two different kinds of the same thing. Uh, so that seems like a really healthy thing. We're encouraging her in, in, in kind of any direction she wants to go as far as that stuff. And she's interested. So that seems like a good sign in terms of us modeling our practices. Um, the, the the reality of what it means to be bi bi religious as a family hasn't really kicked in because of COVID, uh, because everything's been virtual. So, uh, and my wife is starting something new. She she decided not. She's a, she was ordained two years ago, um, and I guess almost three years ago, uh, no, two years ago, and and she was ordained conservative, which is, which it was a choice because we were both raised conservative, but it was a choice on the kind of more pragmatic basis because it's the most, I don't want to besmirch the educations of the other liberal denominations, but what I would say is it's, it's the most, it's the most traditionally rigorous kind of rabbinic education a woman can get, mm-hmm. <laughs> frankly. Uh, so because orthodox denominations don't, ordain women. Hmm. Um, So, and the conservative movement only started ordaining women in the seventies. So that, but that that was never really about like going to get a conservative pulpit in a synagogue and be the sort of cookie cutter rabbi family that, that we both knew growing up. So she took that pedigree and ran with it. And she wants, she's starting something new in Atlanta, a a community for people who don't really have a home in institutional Judaism. And it's pretty far out, the kind of stuff that she's into doing. Um, And she wants my involvement in certain ways, including like teaching meditation, um, Mm -hmm. which is uh, hard, actually. Mm -hmm. It's turned out to not really work so well, but I've Mm -hmm. I've tried. Um, And... I, I'm interested in doing that too, but because it's all virtual, it's very theoretical. Um, and, and then also there's a little, fair bit of like 
calling into services in other synagogues or whatever. Um, sometimes she's participating or leading. Sometimes we're just watching. Uh, and, and I hate that. <laughs> like, I have no interest in watching a Jewish, so, so, like people standing in front of a webcam to do Jewish services on a computer. Like, there's, there's nothing religious to me about that. Um, and she's understanding of that. So, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't pressure me to participate in, in that kind of stuff. But when we go out into the world, it's going to be a little different. And, mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I'm going to be there. A rabbi's spouse is a mem the central member of a religious community, and I'm going to be there. And I'm going to be there to watch the kids while she's up front leading. So, you know, there's, mm -hmm. the, the, that's going to be part of our life. Um, the question is how much of, how much time am I going to be able to spend with my sangha uh, mm -hmm. and Sundays are sort of the big day. And I hope to be able to go at least for the Dharma talk, but ideally for the Zazen beforehand too. And, you know, if I can have Sunday mornings for that, I'll go on Saturday mornings for Shabbat. And that seems like a fair arrangement, mm -hmm. but when it comes to longer practice periods and retreat, like that's the thing I'm really wondering about is, am I going to be able to go on session sometimes for days at a time? Uh, and there's all kinds of other constraints that make me wonder about that. But, you know, it does matter to me that I be able to practice that rigorously from time to time. And because I've been on retreat and know what that means to me. So, mm -hmm. I, and, and like, you know, I, I don't like looking at meditation retreat this way, but like, I do need some time off. <laughs> from mm -hmm. from this rigorous training environment that i live in uh yeah. so you know going and doing zazen and kinhin and all you know like doing that all day doesn't sound rigorous to me it sounds like vacation mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. like uh i, I want to be able to do that sometimes and we just have we're just not there yet in terms of the world around us but we're getting close so i'm definitely beginning to think about it mm -hmm. Uh, but, but, as, but it, it's all I can say about this year is that it's been supportive of our family to have this mm -hmm. for me. And, uh, I intend for that to continue to be true, no matter what, like, I'm never going to turn towards them and away from them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing, you know, <laughs> like that's a meaningless distinction. If, if I were to make that distinction, it would be a false distinction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I have to say like hearing you talk about this both now and online I just am really filled with a lot of joy for you and your family and mm -hmm. um, it's it's a, a real gift that you've been able to find that configuration of like religious traditions and practices and the daily schedule such like it's, it's a gift to you personally but also your you know your wife and your children and the people in your life and and also as an example for for the rest of us i don't know like i'm learning from talking to you and um you know really really appreciate it so i wanted to reflect that um is there anything that you'd want to talk about or cover before we close the show mm. i just think this process that we're going through online, the thing that brought us together, the thing and, and the, the thing that sort of precipitated us talking in this way is so important. It's it's important to me personally because it's providing me with that community that I said I was looking for. Uh I mean, I haven't really fully explained what I meant by that. Like I don't talk to a lot of adults <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis, you know what I mean? And like I used to, and that that's sort of how I learned to be in the world. And so this has been a big change for me. And so part of coming back online after throwing my phone in the proverbial garbage can for a couple of years um, was about finding adults to be in community with. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the, you know, the Sangha, joining the Sangha, it, was, it had all happened at the same time. Um, but I can't hang out with those people all day yet. And I can't <laughs> hang out with the people on Twitter all day. So so it's, you know, I, I, I needed this and I found it and it was, I'm really, really grateful for it. But I, that's not, that very quickly that became not all it was. Mm -hmm. And I think that I'm, that I speak for both of us when I say that there's a way to be of service to this that has truly been 
an honor. And I'm still very much figuring out what that is. Like, I, I'm just mostly just posting crap on Twitter all day. I mean, like I'm sharing my podcast and some people are listening to it and that's wonderful. But like most of what I mean has come in the form of private conversations with people. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you do a ton of that also. Mm -hmm. um, but you've also formalized this into te both teaching modes and also this con conversational mode that's, that's much more in depth uh, than tweeting back and forth all day. Uh, and, and and I I would love to hear you put it into your own words, but but this the this it's something like the kinds of experience that we've had you and I and mm -hmm. and a bunch of others um, practice experience training experience has given us something that we can share that there are a lot more people looking for that haven't found than I thought. Mm. Um, lots of people looking looking for something that isn't offered to them by any of the default means available to them around them and they have found each other so there was this sort of pre-existing thing happening this community of people seeking something and i feel like it mixed together and is still in the process of mixing together with people of our generation, with our amount of training. And there's people older than us with a lot more training too, um, mm -hmm. coming online to find Sangha in a new way. And those, and finding us finding each other is a huge deal because it's making this inter-religious multi-faith coalition of teachers that sort of like are specialists, but are also very, and I'm teacher, I didn't even mean to use that word. Like I don't, I'm not, I'm actually explicitly not identifying myself as a teacher. Like I, mm -hmm. I'm, I feel like a peer giving my buddies some like lightly held help as mm -hmm. an alternative to finding a teacher in, in, in which they have a, with which they, with whom they have a formal relationship. I mean, I do have the privilege of having a formal relationship with a teacher mm -hmm. and, and that I'm relying on that very heavily. Uh, in be in showing up here, being who I am, but I'm being encouraged to do it by him also. And the so there's there's this there's this resourced side of the table, and then there's these people who are so who have the resource of yearning really hard, which is which is nourishing us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and like that the the I I don't want to get into the sort of movement building or identifying or labeling parts of this that a lot mm -hmm. of people on Twitter do like to spend all day tweeting about. I, I don't have predictions for what's happening. I just know that I've never seen anything like this before. And, and that so much of what we talk about is not just like, I had this mind blowing experience while I was meditating or doing LSD or whatever. It, it, so much of what we talk about is like really nuts and bolts stuff about living a good life and being a good person. And mm. That kind of fabric, I mean, it's the thing that like organized religion dreams of having its mm -hmm. people talk about and be, and the way of being this sort of charitable, open-minded giving and receiving, like religious communities talk that into existence all day long. And it never has ever felt like this to me. Yeah. And it, it's, it's, I'm not even saying anything in particular about organized religion or whether that's going to work out or what, what's going to happen here. I'm just saying. I have a good feeling about what's what this is what society how society is going to benefit civilization is going to benefit from this way of being together so mm -hmm. i'm just really grateful to have encountered it and all of these people and you mm -hmm. it's 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 a beautiful reflection and, and so well said and certainly matches my own experience as well i think there's something really precious happening and emergent and you know uh yet to be discovered as well so um i so appreciate your time john and really love this conversation and i'm happy that we're sharing it with the world and uh yeah thank you so much thank you tasha and it was really just after speaking in 280 character bursts all the time <laughs> it was really just a pleasure to really open it up with you and i look totally to again yeah sounds good